strangers, we gotta keep hitting video games. We gotta get this medium locked down, or at least we gotta try. I gotta try, but it's hard. I mean, it's it's really hard. Video games are complicated. I've always looked at them as kind of the the ultimate art form because they can sort of wrap all of the other art forms into one. You know, animation, painting, music composition writing all of these can go into a game on top of the effusive art of actually making a game that people will like this complication is why so many people have already tried their hat at analyzing video games and why we have so much fervor to go see it's our job as analysts to take the frenetic disarray of the world and congeal it down into straightforward understandable concepts we are children of god trying to make order out of chaos to fit the world into the nice little boxes the human brain just feels good living in and in analysis there is no greater box than that of genre and genre in video games it's a freaking mess genre is classification classification that Bradley serves two purposes one is historical and academic making connections between pieces of art you know we can look back at a series of things and see if they were all kind of doing similar things or in the same movement. I have no doubt that one day academics will study the military shooters of the late aughts the way they now study the noir films of the 40s and 50s. The other is for the purpose of recommendation. You're looking for a fun game to play, so you try and find one that looks like other ones you've enjoyed in the past. Like one 2D platformer? Try another. And I think both these functions of genre are failed by the current system, which I should go ahead and describe. The simplest and perhaps best way to categorize video games is to simply describe their mechanics. This is a game where you shoot a gun from a first person perspective. It is a first person shooter. And you got a few like rhythm, platformer, puzzle solving that do a pretty useful job at telling you what you're getting in for, but then soon you just kind of fall in this bottomless hole of unhelpful jargon. Roguelike, Souls-like, Metroidvania, I mean, this is, is this the best we can do? People come and they ask us, uh, what are these games like? And we just gesture, we're just like, ah, they're, they're just kind of like these other ones. Except it's always a criminal under explanation. I mean, I've been hearing people complain that games ascended from Castlevania and Metroid play totally differently for, it seems like, years now. And we still group the two together. Then you got turns of watered down so much that they don't, like, mean anything anymore. I mean, what is a role-playing game? What is an RPG? Is this one? Is this one? Is this one? Is this one? Like, like what are the rules? Does there have to be, like, a really strong narrative? Do you have to create your own character? Or can you take over an already written one? Uh, do there have to be stats involved? Is that it? But how is this process useful for anyone? More specificity leads to more clarity, but it also lowers the usefulness for outsiders, requiring more initiation and more understanding of jargon and specialized terms to kind of get in the club. Then you've got people supplementally trying to group games together by story, plot, or tone. You know, Five Nights at Freddy's is a horror game, as is Dead Cells. Uh, Call of Duty is a gritty, realistic shooter franchise, but Borderlands is more whimsical. The Last of Us is a drama, Uncharted is a thriller. Now you can make the same complaint of arbitrariness of this system and point out its limitations. There are thrills to be had in The Last of Us and drama lying in Uncharted. But what I really like about this system is that it attempts to complement the first system by attacking the problem from a totally different angle. Whereas the first method attempts to tell you what you'll be doing in a video game, the second one tries to tell you how you'll feel when you play it. Like, I could try and sell you on Hollow Knight by saying that it's a semi-open world metroidvania with a weighty combat system and platforming thrown in, but I could also tell you that it's got cute characters and quirky dialogue which contrasts with the game's dark atmosphere and pensive tone. 
I know I've sounded quite negative in this video, but despite my gripes and some terminology, I want you to know that I still think these are actually really great ways to categorize video games. I love these axes. I'm not trying to tear down these two axes. I'm trying to add a new one. I want to add a third genre dimension. Let's let, let, let's turn back the clock. Let's, let's let's back things up. Let's make things less complicated. You know, let's go all the way back to the beginning. When I look at some of the first video games, the arcade games, the Pac-Man, the Asteroid, the Donkey Kong, I look at them, you know what I see? I see pinball. I've always seen pinball as kind of a honorary video game, or at least an honorary arcade game. It is an arcade game. It's played in arcades, and you can see how the design and structure of pinball cabinets helped inform how arcade games would be marketed and designed. If we look at pinball, what is it? Well, you hit a button, and a thing happens, and that thing is hopefully pleasurable. There's a distinct release of dopamine in the crack of the paddle against the ball. It's input and output, and it's really fun, and like, how is this really different from moving a joystick to control Pac-Man around a grid? Sure, there are more and more complicated uh, parts in between, but it's still input and output with the result hopefully being pleasurable. It's a toy. This game as a toy model was refined and improved upon over the years. You know, old arcade sticks, they're so sticky and unresponsive. Developers added more responsive controls and more versatile characters, allowing people to do things in a more fluid and enjoyable way. Responsiveness, rhythm, fluidity, feedback, and satisfaction. 2019 Sekiro Shadows Die Twice has perhaps the highest ratio of fun to button press I've ever encountered. And the game has brilliant presentation, graphics, and things to enjoy on top of this, but the best thing about it is just how fun it is to interact with the core mechanics of the system. Just the sheer purity and responsiveness and clean design of the mechanics allows from software to squeeze every ounce of dopamine out of every button press it is at its core brilliant a brilliant toy and you can look at this and you can see how we got here from what came before not all games were Mario and Contra. I mean, sometimes I look at old video games and I see Dungeons and Dragons. It's no secret how much influence the pen and paper activity had over Dragon Quest and other early video games. It's obvious to see how pen and paper role-playing games led to the first text-based adventures, to point-and-click adventure games, to the first first-person experiences focused on exploration. Dungeons & Dragons is a much more complicated appeal than the visceral joy of pinball. There's nothing really fun about rolling dice or writing down numbers on pieces of paper, but it's what those dice and numbers let you do that you're after you know that roll of the dice represents a fireball that you just flung from your hand an action that you'll never do in real life you're after the role playing the point is to inspire your imagination and creativity to transport you to another world in a similar way to novels or film but not only let you see but to live out a fun and rapturing experience and you can see how this appeal latched on to video games a computer can store more scenarios and dialogue options than the largest choose your own adventure book uh, stats and systems can challenge players in unique ways graphical visuals and audio can not only give the player more information about the characters in the world but can also improve their immersion by just giving the imagination more to work with and this process works well with the increasing capability of technology. You know, every year brings more bits, more RAMs, more masturbation for the PC master race. You can use that technology to enhance 
your system. You can render more mountains and trees for your vast and endless open world or bring up the graphical fidelity on even more beautiful anime waifus. If it's experience you're after, your experience can always be augmented. The first video game that I ever played is Pokemon Leaf Green version. And backed by its iconic soundtrack and beautiful pixel art, the game gives you what essentially every Pokemon game gives you. It's what only Pokemon can really give you. It's this irrational joy, this kind of stupid laughter that I feel even as an adult uh, handling some of the newer entries in the series there's just something magical about trekking into the wild to tame some cute monsters to take on the world and i mean that has to be fun because every other mechanic involved in pokemon is just awful as a teenager i threw most of my limited income into gaming following mostly the trends of the day you know uh, Fallout New Vegas, Assassin's Creed 3, Elder Scrolls Skyrim, Final Fantasy 13. These are the games that dominated my teenage years. All in franchises I no longer play. Once I got out of high school, I took a chance and picked up Bloodborne, which would kick off a new era of gaming for me. Dark Souls, Doom, Cuphead, Nier Automata, now these are the games that I enjoy. And I went back to some of the games I played as a kid and I was like, this is the least fun thing I've ever done in my entire life. Skyrim, Assassin's Creed, what Final Fantasy 13 is making your combat system feel boring, you know you messed up. You know, these games, they just feel bad to move around in, like your character is stuck in molasses. Button presses feel stiff and unresponsive. Combat is repetitive and unchallenging. Why can I no longer stand these games I once put hundreds of hours into? It's because I moved where I stand on the third axis of video game genres. The third axis of video game genres, it's a gradient. And it's not a laundry list of things or configurations. It only looks at two factors. Whether your game is more of a toy or more of an experience. Toys focus on game feel above everything else. They're about getting the player to do fun and engaging things. You know, they prioritize fluidity and responsiveness, feedback, and often challenge. Fighting games are kind of the ultimate example of the games as a toy model. And there's a reason that I really haven't discussed multiplayer games this video so far. is because they're almost all toys and thus kind of dodge this axis. Though there are experience-based multiplayer games. The word toy is a bit negatively connotated, but push past that. It's a thing you interact with to feel joy on a visceral and mechanical level. It's just a noble endeavor. On the other hand are experiences, which have always been with video games, but are getting more and more popular as game technology gets more and more advanced. You know, if a game is advertising itself by player choice, uh, complexity, and options, it's probably more of an experience. Skyrim is loaded up with a dozen biomes to explore, hundreds of people to talk to. The game has culture, politics, racial conflict, and history you can learn about, read about. It's a spectacular achievement, so complex it's wondrous it even exists. There's a reason it and games like it are so popular. Experiences aim to show the player something new, to push the boundary of what's possible, and they gel well with a modern media environment that is often trying to do just that. I want to be clear, uh, toys, experiences, neither of these are better or worse than the others. Earlier in the video, I bagged on some experience style games, but that's just because I'm a person who enjoys to be closer to the toy side of the spectrum. And everything you've ever played is not on the extremes of the spectrum, but rather somewhere in the middle, in between perhaps on one end a, you know, uninteractive walking simulator, or on the other hand, a fully abstract mechanic. I can't fully abandon experiences. I mean, 
I love narrative, and narratively focused games are always going to air more to the side of experience. I mean, my favorite game of 2018 was God of War, in which you were essentially an actor in a brilliant movie, one that aims to awe with its thrills, its color palette, its atmosphere, its character progression, and there's still a game there, it's still a toy, but it's not completely its whole focus. It's the reason I haven't replayed God of War. It's hard to sit through those long, tone-driven cutscenes a second time. That's the thing about experiences. They're often powerful for their novelty, something that eventually wears off. A very similar game is The Last of Us Part Two, which dominated my summer with its brilliance, and I think that the real tragedy of that game is that everybody, including myself, chose to talk about the game's story instead of its gameplay, which was honestly better and jaw-droppingly brilliant. You know, sometimes they let you attack scenarios in dozens, if not hundreds, of different ways. The game was incredibly uh, expressive to player skill. I'm going off script here for a second, but like, at those higher difficulties, they really, to me, squeezed, like, everything they could out of their mechanics, enemy design, level design. It was just, it was just freaking fun, man. There's a reason everybody focuses on the story. The game wants you to. It was marketed that way. I mean, the game has upwards of 10 hours of story content in it. More cutscenes than you can shake a stick at. There are half hour sections of the game where the only thing you're really doing is maybe slightly moving the analog stick, perhaps with a button press or two every once in a while. There have been a lot of bad reasons given to dislike The Last of Us Part Two, but while I was playing it, I couldn't help but think to myself, man, this game would really suck if I couldn't sit through all these cutscenes. And I personally found them riveting, riveting enough for two playthroughs, but if you've got ADHD out the wazoo and you don't find it particularly compelling, yeah man, skip this one, I get it. I can totally see it being too slow for people, people who don't really value the experience, would prefer something more to the toy side of the spectrum. And on the other hand, more experienced, you know, based players might look at kind of toy-based games and think that they're either unwelcoming or that they want something a little richer and more complex. What I like about this axis is it makes recommending things, remember, it's like half the whole point of genre. Uh, easier by sort of nailing down what the player wants to do. Do you want to experience a brand new world and be wowed by something new, or would you rather sit down and relax with a sweet-ass toy? Like, right now, I have been playing the heck out of Hades, which is really freaking fun, and just, like, getting in the buttons and dodging attacks, weaving through, and talking to the gods, and, like, yeah, there's experience in it, but I would say it's more to the toy side. And, like, later in this, probably the only game that I'll buy uh, for the rest of the year, if it comes out this year, is going to be Cyberpunk uh, 2077. Yeah, Cyberpunk 2077, which, again, is going to have a lot of gameplay in it, but I think we can all agree that that's more to the experience side of things. Again, no game is purely on one side of the spectrum or the other. Like we've talked about, there are experience-based games like The Last of Us that have brilliant toys in them. And there are toy-based games like Sekiro that have beautiful and jaw-dropping experiences in them. Uh, I don't know where to draw the line, and I kind of have difficulty talking about games like Control that might kind of split the difference and sit down the middle of the axis. This is an idea that I've only just come up with, though it's so simple that I honestly am pretty sure and kind of hope that other people have come up with it or have kind of talked about it in uh, different ways uh, before, and I'm still kind of working on it. You know, this, this is like a raw idea. It's unfinished. It needs further discussion to reach its final form, which is why I want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on this toy versus experience dichotomy? Do I need different labels? Uh, is this a good axis to be analyzing genres on? Are there any other axes that I haven't mentioned? Uh, what should we be trying to do? Like, what is the purpose of genres? What are we trying to accomplish? I want to hear all of your thoughts 
in the comments below. That's where the comments below that go below the video. I'm sorry, my brain is kind of fried. I'm looking into blinding lights of Adelon Day. I've been editing a lot of novel. I just voted. Uh, I'm about to go to band practice. Uh, I'm, I'm not in the band. I do the audio mixing. Don't worry. I am not that cool. Anyway, so I am Wyatt the Word Weaver. Follow me on Twitter for more just unfiltered screaming from my brain and hot selfies and hopefully not depression posts. Uh, Y'all be good.